There are no more important traditions in the Navy, but that are filled with more urban legend than the Chief Petty Officer initiation process. Today, we feature Master Chief Jim Lucy to briefly introduce his book, A Tradition of Change, CPO Initiations to CPO 365 and Back. Stay tuned for our expert panel, including our 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy and two retired Fleet Master Chiefs to add to Master Chief Lucy's observations and discuss the brilliant performance of our Navy's enlisted personnel. One common misconception uh, of uh, CPO initiations is they've been around since the 1890s. As it turns out, CPO initiations really began to appear during World War II as minor pranks that generally did not violate Navy regulations. They also did not have any training value. Initiations were not intended to train you how to be a chief. It was simply entertainment for the guys who were already CPOs. However, things began to change in the 1970s. Many of the chiefs during this era had mixed feelings about initiations. The number of women, for example, increased exponentially from about 5,000 in 1970 to over uh, 50,000 a decade later. As a result, CPO initiations changed years earlier because of inappropriate lewd pranks that were now viewed as a violation of regulations and policy. However, at sea, especially on submarines, CPO initiations uh, continued as usual with those all-male crews. Alcohol abuse at CPO initiations became an issue in the 1980s and 1990s. CPO initiations were often described as drunk fests with no professional training, but simply entertainment for the genuine CPOs. During this time, professional training associated with CPO initiation was generally zero. Even though the often given reason for CPO initiations was to train new chiefs, CPO initiations were often compared to college fraternity initiations and parties. It came to a head in 1988. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Trost came very close to banning CPO initiations as a result of egregious alcohol-related incidents. Several of these related to the death or injury of naval personnel this included a growing number of DUI incidents related to CPO initiations. Many of these incidents were reported by the press, which drew the attention of Congress, but it just wasn't DUIs. Many CPO initiations were getting out of hand with crude and lewd behavior. There was a conflict of Navy regulations with regard to hazing by creating an unsafe and hazardous condition for selectees. This in turn focused the attention on the CNO towards eliminating CPO initiations and simply having a pinning ceremony. However, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Dwayne Bushy, presented a plan to the CNO to implement reforms to CPO initiations. The first step would be to ban alcohol consumption by CPO selectees during the initiation. He just looked at me and says, Admiral Borders told you, gave you your order, you will do away with CPO initiations. I said, well then, sir, you better get a new microphone right now. I said, you hired me as the Master Chief of the Navy to lead the CPO mess. You haven't given me the opportunity to do that. So if you don't have enough faith in me, then you need to fire me right now or give me the opportunity to fix it. And he stared at me for a while and he said, it is going to be a very emotional issue. He says, tell me what you're going to do. And I said, here it is right here. I prepared and I had an outline written up. I called all the fleet and force NAS chiefs, and I'd call all the Nick Ponds. Uh, so I had my ducks in a row, and he looked at my plan of action, what I was going to do for CPO initiation, and he says, I'll ride with you one year. You don't fix it, we're doing away with it. Over the following decades, CPO initiations would slowly evolve into a program that now lives up to the initial reasons for having them in the first place. CPO initiations have been managed by the Nick Ponds since Nick Pond Black. For decades, the MCPONs have published annual guidance on CPO initiation. Each MCPON has championed reforms and the expectations of chief petty officers down to the individual CPO. Senior enlisted leadership is now held accountable for any 
inappropriate, unsafe incidents which occur during uh, CPO initiations. However, many CPO initiations were still out of bound with uh, Navy regulations. McPond Bushy was relieved by McPond Hagen in 1992. During Hagen's uh, tenure, the Navy got a better handle and control over CPO initiations which uh, eventually set the groundwork for meaningful training. I took down the plan. I spent 45 minutes laying out the plan. I took all the exhibits in a big Xerox box. And Admiral Borda said, I'm not sure how I feel. I am sure that I don't like CPO initiation. I haven't liked the looks that I've had at CPO initiation, and I'm not sure how I'm going to go. That was Friday afternoon late. I went back up the hill with a heavy heart. Wednesday morning, midweek the next week, the CNO said, I'm going to give you a go. I said, you won't regret it. The next time I saw him in person a couple of days later, I said, we won't embarrass you. You won't regret it. You won't have it. He said, no, no, stop. Somebody will screw it up. We will deal with it on the basis of what it is. But don't make me promises you can't keep. Don't care. You can't cash that check, so don't write it. He had a great attitude, but he didn't have to do that. He could have easily said, CPO initiation is extinct. We will have a pinning ceremony that, uh, you know, that was what he was being urged to do. Over the following years, the MECPONs have continued to oversee the training of CPO selectees. Traditions, as long as they're good. Now, we had the CPO initiations, which got out of hand, we have to admit. Well, that, that wasn't good. Crossing the equator. I think that is good because that builds on the morale of our troops, our crews, ships crews now. And you see the anticipation there now. Then you issue them the certificate and it's something they hold on to for the rest of their life. And I think uh, tradition, uh, knowing that those people went through the great ports of the United States, that's what helped keep this country free. And I, that's, to me, is, tradition is of great value. Thank you, Master Chief Lucy. Again, his great book dispels urban legend and gives a great account of the important eras in the CPO initiation journey. Let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in purchasing this great book. And while you're there, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive future notifications of our show. Our panel today is very special. We have with us today our 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, and now Chairman of the Navy League of the United States, Mike Stevens. We also have Fleet Master Chief April Beldo, who has a leadership position with USAA as the Director of Enterprise Events and Protocol. Welcome. The first question goes out to Mick Pond Stevens. You were the impetus behind this CPO 365 season and actually commissioned Master Chief Lucy to write his book. What would you like to say about your transformational efforts in elevating the CPO season and in changing the process? You have the first and last word on this change. Thanks, Sonny. And before I get started, let me just um, acknowledge my, my dear friend and counterpart and fellow Master Chief April Beldo. It's, um, wonderful to be able to participate in this uh, program with April. As a matter of fact, I have April listed as one of the people that I hold in high regards as a mentor. She may not know that, but um, many of the things that she did in the Navy, groundbreaking things that she did in the Navy, uh, the advice that she offered me when she was the Fleet Master Chief for uh, N1, uh, the relationship we had throughout our time in the Navy once I got a chance to meet the April and see her at RTC Great Lakes and then later on as her carrier tour. Um, I always admired the way she did business, her integrity, the way she adhered to the values of our Navy and to see her go on and do great things in the private sector, which is no, which is no surprise to me at all, um, is just wonderful. So I, I wanted to first just acknowledge April because it really is a pleasure to be here with you, April. And likewise, same with you, Sonny. I mean, you and I have been friends for a long time, and I appreciate all the things that you do for our sailors and the passion you have and for providing us with this opportunity. So thank you very much. Um, now I'll, I will try to 
answer this question. So there's what people know, and then there's what re what's reality. Um, and so the iterative step that I took to CPO 365 um, captured a lot of attention. But let me say this, that um, I didn't come up with CPO 365. Uh, folks don't know this, but CPO 365 started in, uh, in Bahrain uh, with the CPO mess that was down there in the 2010 uh, time frame I th is when it started, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Uh, so uh, Mick Pond West at the time had, had brought together the Fleet Master Chiefs and he said, hey, um, I think it's time that we really take a good hard look at CPO induction, which is what we were calling it at the time, which was really no different than initiation and transition. We just changed the names, but we didn't change the process. And he said, I'd like for us to start thinking about how we can evolve this and make this um, more of a professional opportunity and still retain all the goodness because there's a, there's always been and continues to be a lot of goodness with uh, the CPO. Um, I'll, I'll just refer to it as initiation because that's what we call it now. So uh, there's always been a lot of goodness to it. And the idea was to retain the goodness, to shed off the things that didn't have value uh, and to look for new opportunities. Uh, so I was uh, on a plane flying to the Middle East with Admiral Harvey when I was at Fleet Forces Command, and I was thinking a lot about um, Rick's or Mick Pond West's uh, mandate or request to the Fleet Master Chiefs at the time. Uh, I went out to Bahrain, had an opportunity, a pleasure uh, opportunity to speak with the CPO mess, and we were talking about this subject. And I looked over in the corner and they had their guide on over there in the CPO mess. It's the one they would use during initi uh, initiation for their runs. And guess what it said on the on the guide on, right? It said CPO 365, right? So this wasn't something that was, you know, thought of and developed, uh, you know, at the McPawn or Fleet Force level. This is where it should start. It started at the deck plates. And I asked them, I said, what, what do you mean by CPO 365? And the CMC at the time said, we don't believe you can build a chief petty officer in six or seven weeks. We believe it takes a year round concerted effort. So this is what we do. And he laid it out to me. And I thought to myself, wow, with a couple of adjustments and some changes, this is something we might be able to bring to the Navy writ large. So on the way back to the States, you know, it's what, about a 14 hour flight. So I had plenty of time in the back of the plane to start sketching out a wireframe of what this could look like. And we brought CPO 365 back to the McPawn's office and we had a discussion, you know, and Rick West, McPawn West, who's also a mentor of mine, certainly wiser than me at the time and, and probably still so today, uh, we, we proposed this to him, this concept of year-round training called CPO 365. And I was young and, you know, full of energy and probably, a, you know, wanting to move a little bit faster than he or the Navy was willing to go at the time, and, probably, and rightfully so. And I said to him, I said, why don't we just go to CPO 365 and just, re like, remove the, the initiation part of it um, and just retain some of it, right? And he said, no, Mike, I don't think so. I, I think we got to move into this a little bit slower. He said, uh, maybe the next McPawn or the one after that can consider that. But let's just take a, a step, a big step, though. And so that year, I, I believe that year was 2010, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to go back and look at my calendar. But um, we rolled out. CPO 365 slash induction, right? We didn't do away with the name induction. And 75% of what um, we later, you know, when I became the MCPON in 2013, we sundown induction, the name, uh, we still retain much of the traditional aspects of it, but we focused even more so on the CPO 365 aspect of it but there was not really much change from when Rick went through CPO 365 slash induction to where we just went to CPO 365. 
the change was in the name. And I guess that's what made people pay attention because when they saw the sensational headlines in, in Navy Times, you know, in bold red with me with an angry face or something like that, they, you know, that caught people's attention. Uh, if they had been paying really close attention, they would have realized that that change had already occurred. 75% of that change had already occurred. And we were just transitioning into a new phase of it, right? So the, there was this iterative adjustment that was taking place. Um, very few people know that, where that name came from. They don't know that the, the, the initial steps had happened much earlier than that. And like Rick said, that next that next jump was probably going to have to occur in the next pick, Mick Pond. I had no idea of knowing at the time that that would be me. <laughs> but uh, as it turns out, it was. And so that's kind of uh, what leads us up into the remainder of the questions, that, or at least some of the questions you'll have, Sonny. I'll stop there because there's more to it. but. I don't want to monopolize the first part of the show here. Well, uh, everyone uh, in, the, in our audience joins me in thanking you for clearing that up because, uh, again, uh, urban legend, things of this nature, you, you are the final word. You were there. And, of course, uh, lots of uh, kudos to our 12th McPond, Rick West. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that the most influential person in my naval career was my first chief then Senior Chief Bosun Mate, John Allen Eichhorn. To truly master the rite of passage for a junior officer is to cultivate the best possible relationship with your first Chief Petty Officer. Fleet Beldo, how are Chief Petty Officers taught to become true mentors to their division officers? And can you provide a few examples of your experience in this area? Good morning, Admiral Masso and Mick Pond Stevens, first of all. And forgive me for still using the, um, the traditional military titles, but I can't get it out of my system out of 34 years of serving. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And Mike, um, I definitely appreciate um, your words um, earlier and likewise, definitely likewise. And I will tell everybody a short story, even about Admiral Masso. I don't know if he remembers this or not, but again, when I was at RTC and we had to go down to, um, Bupers in um, 2005, 2006-ish. That was my opportunity to um, really um, get an opportunity to understand what really meant. And um, it's leaders like both of you that allowed me to be authentic, my authentic self, and, and listen to what I had to say um, that set me up, I do believe, for my um, future um, um, commands, I will say, in the Navy. So thank you. Thank you. And one of the things to answer your question, um, Admiral Masso, is I believe as we got to a training process during um, um, the Chief's initiation um, training, making sure that our up and coming Chief Petty Officers understood that the Chief's mess did have a role in making sure that we set up our young ensigns as division officers and the Lieutenant JGs, et cetera, up for success, whatever their path was, you know, and I, I would have never thought that as a chief petty officer that years down the road, I would see one of my division officers as a commanding officer of an aircraft carrier or as a flag officer. But that first interaction that that chief petty officer has with their division officer sets the tone. And I believe that there are leaders out there that we want to emulate. And there are leaders out there that we learn from that there are things that we don't want to continue to do or do in a leadership position. And that first conversation that we have during um, Chief's training, I think, sets the tone and how we deliver that information and how we set the expectations and make sure that they understand that, yes, the Chief's mess does have a role, does have a role in training up division officers. So. Um, I, I just think, you know, if you can visualize what you want your leadership to be in the word room, and then you have an opportunity to get them on that track, why not take advantage of that as a chief's mess? So I think it's that conversation that we have with those chief petty officers, uh, making sure that they understand our role and the uh, word room's development. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I would say this uh, about that. Um, a good J.O. will hear from the bull ensign 
that when you uh, go into the chief's mess, you pound on that door and you ask permission to enter. And, uh, and if you do that a few times, the entire chief's mess will love you. So, because uh, they know that you get, you know, that unique uh, aspect. Uh, this question is for both uh, Fleet Beldo and Mick Pond Stevens. How does the unique relationship change with officers when you are a force or fleet master chief relating to flag officers in terms of command climate, truth to power conversations? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? We, you know, we just mentioned the uh, chief petty officer to Ensign or JG. Now we're talking uh, fleet force um, or force fleet and MCPON to uh, flag officers. How does that change? Yeah, if you're, are you wanting me to start that question, Sonny? Please. So if I could, I, I'll answer that. I'd like to circle back a second just on the um, question that uh, Fleet Bel Beldo gave a response to. Um, because there's two sides to that coin, and I want to share with you those two sides of that coin. And for every chief petty officer that's, you know, taking the time to watch this program, I think it's important that we know this. And for those that are not watching, I hope you share it with them. So as a, I'd, I'd say as a mid-level command master chief, I was at the 06 level, and I won't name the command and I won't name the person out of respect, but uh, I was I was asked to come over. I uh, accepted orders to this command. It was a it was a large command, so we had a number of other organizations under us. And I was talking to my captain up at this time about um, the CPO season, the importance of it, so on and so forth. And that led us into another conversation. And he was very honest with me. And I appreciate this honesty because that conversation led us down an entirely different path and ultimately ended up in a good place. But you know what he told me is he said, I remember my time as a JO, as a division officer, and even as a young department head. And he says, and I want to tell you, I have no, he says, I really don't have any reverence at all for the CPO mess. Because when I was a divo, my chief set me up for failure. He said he talked down to me, he belittled me. Instead of helping me in many ways, he teased me. Um, and ultimately I struggled as a, a division officer and it was very hard for me to recover from that. And he says, then as a department head, I had kind of the same experience. And he said, so you do what you gotta do with the chief's mess. He says, but I don't think there's any value in this thing you guys call the brother or the sisterhood or the fraternity. Right. And I was really taken back by that, you know, and he was so he was and I said to him, I said, Captain, I said, first of all, let me if I could, I'd like to apologize for you having had that experience, because that's not what it's supposed to be about. And I know that you're, you know, you're I think at the time he had 22 years in the Navy, maybe 23 years in. I saw him as a 30 year officer for sure. Not, you know, and I said, look, we're going to be together for the next you know, two or three years, I said, I hope to, I hope to fix that at some level. You never can fix it in its entirety because that damage was done. So I spent that next couple of years just really working with our CPO mess to show him what a real CPO mess can do to help him and his command by leading up, by leading down, leading across, being influencers within the organization. So we put in that extra effort. So two years later, he's getting ready for his change of command. And, you know, he comes to me and he says, you know, he called me Mike. He says, you know, Mike, I'm so grateful for this experience because I'm going to move on to my next command. And he says, and now I understand the value of a CPO mess. Right. And I always tell these chief petty officers, young chief petty officers, you know, look, put in the time, put in the work, be careful what you say and what you do, because the future of the Navy, as far as senior leaders go, Every CNO, every vice CNO, every fleet commander, type com, every commander that w the Navy will promote one day is out there right now, and they're all junior officers. And the experience they have with us in large part will shape the way they make decisions and how they interact with the force in the future. 
And dare say we've probably had some very senior people that didn't have positive experiences with the CPO mess. And as a result of it, it was very difficult to work with some of those people and you can't fault them. So I just wanted to touch base on that because there's been, there's certainly a lot more positive experiences than negative, but you gotta be careful because that one negative experience can have a profound Im impact on not just the individual, but on the force that they may be responsible for leading one day. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that if you don't mind. Okay, what was the question, Sonny? The question was, and we, but first of all, this is, this is an important discussion. And so if you deviate, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but the discussion is, is, a, you know, we laser focused on, on uh, the, CPO to the new Divo, but now we're talking about if you're a Force Fleet or a MCPON, how, how does that relationship change in the same influential manner uh, with, uh, with a flag officer? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I saw that play out in spades with April, with Fleet Beldo, and uh, at that time, CNP, Admiral Moran. I mean, you didn't get anything past Admiral Moran unless it went through April Beldo first. <laughs> she, those two were thick as thieves. They worked closely together. He made no decisions when it came to the enlisted force without having an in-depth conversation with her. Uh, and I was very thankful that I had the relationship with Fleet Beldo because on many occasions, you know, I would get the invite to come up to the hill on N1 there and sit in the conference room with April and, um, and Admiral Moran, and I, and I had the privilege of witnessing, you know, the the influence and the reverence that that she had and he held in regards to Fleet Beldo. Uh, and so I, I I had a chance to really watch that play out. But I will say, I don't know who's mentoring who at that level, right. you know, <laughs> because you're both about the same age. You both have a lot of experience. You just have slightly different perspectives because you um, grew up in the force different, you know, um, but a lot of your experiences were the same. I, I mean, I the flag officers I worked for were Vice Admiral Mel Williams, Admiral Harvey, Admiral Greener, uh, and then uh, Admiral Richardson. You know, what do you teach those guys? You know, these are some, it, you know, I just say they're brilliant, if not geniuses. Um, they're good, they're amazing people, you know, people, person, leaders. Um, and so I think it was a shared space. Um, I had the opportunity, hopefully just through my actions and the way I did business and the commitment to the Navy to have some influence on them. And likewise, the way they made decisions and the way that they solicited advice and recommendations from me, I always felt grateful because they never had to do that, but they did. And I, I was hopefully I was able to provide them with some different perspective, but I think it's a mutual relationship. There's, you know, I'm not going into the room and teaching Admiral Richardson how to be a leader or how to, you know, how to make decisions. He knows how to do that. I'm providing him perspective on something slightly different, or I should say I'm providing him with a slightly different perspective on how I see it through my own personal lens. Um, so I think if you're a if you're a, a, a young master chief or master chief and you get selected to go serve with a flag officer, take that promotion or that opportunity with a great deal of humility, because you're probably going to learn more from that individual than they're going to learn from you. But every time you get the chance to provide them with some insights, know what you're talking about, be thoughtful, do your homework. Right. Don't go in there half baked and provide some response that may or may not be accurate because it, all it'll do if it's not right is erode your credibility. So I used to say I'd rather get it. I'd rather get it right late than wrong early and do my homework. Right. And I know I know Fleet Builder knows what I'm talking about, because if you go in there and you're and you're kind of half cocked, they'll look at you like, what do you, you know, what do you kind of advice are you giving me? Right. And so you learn, you know, I learned that with Vice Admiral Williams because we had these conversations. He said, look, I want your advice, but I want to make sure that what you're telling me is spot on, because if it's not, I may make a decision and it may not be the right decision. Right. So these are I think these are mutual relationships. Sonny. Fleet, Fleet Bell, though, what are what are your thoughts? Uh, and again, spot on. But what I would add to that with regards to um, 
the difference between, you know, the division officer and the flag officer uh, perspective is your breadth of influence and the decisions that you make will largely, you know, affect a larger group of individuals. So whereas, you know, my first command, I was on a destroyer, you know, we had 220 people, you know, that the skipper and, and myself made decisions based on that particular audience. However, as you move up and get selected for these force and fleet positions, to see uh, Mike's point, you know, you have to remember whatever you share with the boss or whatever recommendations or, or decisions that you might make together, the number of individuals it will affect. And, and that's very important. That's very important that that humility piece that, again, Mike talks about, yes, we're in this position, grateful to be in the position, but understand, you know, why we're in these positions and what we share with the boss, it, it's going to, you know, affect a lot of individuals, sailors. So we need to make sure that we do our homework and, and, and we go into the situation very humble. Well, and when I was, uh, when I was view purrs, I'm also, sorry, complete, go I'm ahead. Sorry. And I was just going to say and remember that our decisions also affect our bosses, you know, um, uh, I say brand now because that's what I use in the private sector, but, you know, they're, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Mike? Um, credibility, their credibility. Thank you. Uh, when I was Bu Purs, and I, I mentioned this to you both, and you knew it really in the moment, uh, I had about every six weeks what we called a uh, two-star night out. And, uh, and I had uh, Michael Harris, who was the uh, master chief of PERS-4, which is all uh, distribution and placement. I had my force master chief, Daryl Charles, who was my right arm uh, in, in the command. I had uh, Billy Hill, who was the uh, CMC, uh, chief ma uh, command master chief detailer and Jarita Kearns, who was PERS 40, which is enlisted distribution. And we would uh, go to dinner and eat barbecue, or we'd go to, a, we, we went to Memphis Tiger female basketball, you know, women's basketball games. We went to various, you know, Memphis Redbirds, you know, wherever we could get together. And even though it sounded social, it was actually very professional because we were rolling out perform to serve. We're rolling out uh, billet-based distribution. Uh, lots of enlisted classification issues. Uh, and, and they were giving me ground truth, which I in turn uh, conveyed back to Fleet McCaleb, but also to Admiral Harvey and Admiral Ferguson as CNP. And CNO would call, and he would, he would wanna know. Uh, so uh, th this was an invaluable tool for me to really get uh, truth to power. How does this really play in the fleet? And, uh, and I considered it a very important and necessary metric. So. But thank you both, uh, you know, for your, your thoughts on that. Um, Fleet Beldo, what are your thoughts about gender integration? And what are some of the current challenges facing CPO leadership as the lines become blurred or disappear between women performing in non-traditional rates? Okay, now, um, Admiral, I'm going to... I'm going to just ask you to go a little bit further with regards to the lines being blurred. Um, what, spe what specifically are you asking me? Well, the, the question really comes from back in the day, female sailors were generally in about four or five rates, and now they're everywhere. They're heavy equipment operators, they're line mechanics, they're machine repair, re machinery repair professionals. And, uh, and I guess really the question is, what are your thoughts about how that was integrated, how it's going now from your perspective, understanding you're retired a few years, but uh, you know, take it, take it in any direction you'd like. All right, all right, great, thanks. Well, first of all, I, I think it was a wise decision for the Navy to understand that it's not based on whether, what your gender is, male or female. More importantly is can you do the job? Can you do the job? And we saw that as we started integrating with our um, submarine force. I'll use that for example. I had the wonderful opportunity to be a part of that um, initiative. Um, back in 2013, we started having the conversations uh, about putting um, female sailors on submarines. 
And whether it's a submarine, whether you're on an um, aircraft carrier, whether you're a heavy equipment operator, as you said, it's not about gender. It's about can you do the job? We've even transitioned to um, special forces, which is, I again, I believe it was time for the Navy to, you know, take the blinders off and let's remember what our responsibility is to meet the needs of the force and how do we man the force, right? Um, so I don't think there should be any challenges. You know, we treat sailors like we treat sailors and we set expectations for each sailor. And if that sailor can meet those expectations, then my, you know, hats off to them, go do the work um, and do it well. So for us to transition and I, for me to be able to be a part of that and watch that happen um, from when I first came in in 19, you know, 83, where to your point, put traditional positions for females, you know, yeomen, um, PN, things like that, administrative, now to being able, you know, to be in special forces on a submarine, we have set ourselves up for success as we move into the future as a Navy, because our population becomes so much more greater and we get the best um, um, sailor in a position. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that great answer. And uh, I could not agree more. Uh, for uh, Mick Pond Stevens, just prior to your assignment as Fleet Master Chief of Fleet Forces Command, during that tour and at the beginning of your tenure as Mick Pond, the Navy instituted many rate consolidations. Some seemed easy, like boiler technician consolidating with machinist mates rate. But as we drifted from steam to gas turbine, nuclear propulsion, and of course, main propulsion diesels on our LSDs, uh, where, you know, that seemed easy, but uh, where were consolidations more tricky or harder to grasp for the rates involved? And, uh, you know, some come to mind where, uh, you, you know, there was always a rate that seemed to be, you know, at a loss for uh, equal opportunity and promotion in that. Any thoughts uh, from you, Mick Pond, and then I'll take your thoughts as well, Fleet, because of your N1 experience. Uh, Mick Pond. Sure, uh, I um, certainly love to talk about that. I also would like to just add on to what April said again. So this is me, you know, constantly deviating from the script, but- um, Which is okay. You know, with, uh, with our women in the Navy, I think when you look at the more junior sailors, and I'm talking, you know, E5 and below, we have a lot of women in a lot of different places. I think where, the, where it starts to get really challenging is when it becomes more senior because, and we're working really hard at it. I know I talk to leaders in the Navy, but we're still not there, you know, creating the environment that is, and, I, and I'm careful when I say accommodating because I don't mean that in a soft sort of way. I mean that you have to recognize your total force and you have to have an environment that's established and that you can maintain that affords this equal opportunity for everybody to seek the opportunities that the Navy has. And it really used to bother me when you would look, you know, you start getting up into the E8, especially in the E9 level and the number drops precipitously. And so I remember traveling around the, the world and talking to groups of women about why that is. And I got to tell you, the, the perception that I had was wrong because what they taught me was that basically we didn't know what we were talking about. You know, we were assuming it was one thing when it was something entire, entirely different. And it's not any different in the private sector. When you look at something like, I think 40% of all women that graduate from, uh, or all 40% of all graduates from engineering programs are women, but less than 10% of women make up uh, engineering professional, the engineering professional um, spectrum. And it's, this, you know, you, you talk to the private sector and you talk to the Navy, what they will tell you is it's, it's the conditions. It doesn't afford the opportunity to stick around for the time frame that's necessary. Not everybody, has the stick to itiveness, stick to itiveness and fortitude that April has. I mean, Fleet Beldro, Fleet, Fleet Beldro sacrificed a lot to stick around in the Navy as long as she did and rise to the level that she's at. And anybody that knows her knows the sacrifices that she made. And 
you know, I, I think that we have to really take a good hard look at that. And I, and I think we are, you know, it's just moving like molasses sometimes to get there. So senior rate or junior ratings, yeah, we're doing a good job. We have a lot of women filling those positions, but as we move up the, the, the chain, what we'll find is that those numbers get really small, really fast in proportion. I'm talking about in proportion, right? So I, um, I say that so that not because I'm saying, here's how we fix it. I'm just saying that we always have to be mindful of that. We have to be working towards it. That's all. And I do think the Navy's doing that. April and I are both on a, on a, on a group um, that's looking at problems, you know, challenges like that and others. Um, she, April's certainly more vocal and active in that than I am because she has the experience and the knowledge. And I'm kind of an observer most of the time, offer us a, a thought here or there. But um, anyways, I just wanted to mention that, Sonny. So rate consolidation, you know, you and I talked about this earlier. I know that nobody at N1 and nobody at, uh, at Bupers sits around the room and says, you know, how can we make the life of sailors harder? You know, and how can we do something that they're not going to like? You know, these decisions are thought out. Um, they're, you know, we'll just call it they're war gamed. We understand the pros and cons to it. And these decisions are made because it's in the best interest holistically of the Navy. And sometimes it may not feel like it because it's not about this very moment in time. It's about what the future looks like. Um, you know, I've done some research, you know, if machinist mates used to work, you know, you used to, we used to call people like machinist mates coal heavers, right? And an aviation structural mechanic used to be an aviation carpenter's mate. And I assure you, when they made those changes, the sailors that it affected were not happy about it because one thing I learned the hard way is that ratings are just as about an emotional thing as you can bring to the table when it comes to a sailor. Uh, they, they take great pride in those names. Um, they become emotionally invested in those names. And when you change that name, even though the job itself may not change much, um, you're not always gonna get the most positive response, but those changes do have to be made, you know, in order for the Navy to move, you know, into the future and I always said to a sailor, you want to be a, you know, what do you want to be first? You want to be a sailor or do you want to be an aviation structural mechanic hydrauliksman, right? Because I used to be aviation structural mechanic and we had hydrauliksman and we merged that and everybody's an aviation structural mechanic and the hydrauliksman were all upset about it, right? And so I said, what do you want to be a sailor or do you want to be this? Well, I want to be both. And I said, well, look, in, in, in a couple of weeks of training and six months of OJT, right? You, you're just as competent as anybody else in this, you know, we'll call it new rating, and you're still a sailor. I mean, the things that we do in most cases are not that difficult to learn because of the way that we teach and the way that we do business. Um, sometimes they're so technical, it becomes a challenge, but often, most of the time it's not. So I think, Sonny, I think it's more an emotional thing than anything else not to discount that in some cases it is hard to change rates because you are changing you know your knowledge base etc but um the navy makes those decisions i'm confident for all the right reasons because i've seen how they play out fleet beldo thoughts um, i would just like to add um that and when we do make those decisions when and i'm going to use an example um the the pc for instance, and I know we talked about this earlier, um, and then they have to take this consolidated test. We, I think we did the PC, the DK, and um, I can't remember which other one is. Chime in if you remember, Mike. Um, but my age is getting catching up with me. Close but enough. We, but one of the things we found out is maybe that when it come came to um, promotion time, that maybe the the advancement exam was not proportioned correctly. So the only thing I wanted to add was as we go into this and as we learn, we continue to grow and we continue to make adjustments and we just don't flat out say it is what it is and we're finished. I believe there's always some research behind the decisions we make and we do try to improve on a decision if we see that, you know, somebody was put at a different, if the rating was put at a different advantage or at a disadvantage. Yeah, thank you very much. And just uh, for your own situational awareness, 
uh, Mark Farum's on board and, uh, you know, he was a Navy Times reporter. We considered him a great friend, uh, Admiral Harvey and I, when I was specifically the N1B, and we would always introduce uh, new and, and innovative changes to our, our personnel issues. Uh, we would introduce those to Mark because we always got a fair uh, assessment. We didn't get always the one we wanted, but we got a fair one. And, and he was a, a very honest and, and great uh, advocate for the truth. And he is now a first class petty officer and he's a journalist. And I don't know if you knew that or not. And he works for Admiral now, but he's, uh, he's the oldest um, uh, enlisted sailor in the Navy at 62 years old. And we're happy he's aboard our show t today. Uh, we've got um, uh, Senior Chief Petty Officer Jerry Powell initiated in 82. Uh, Demarius Franklin, Senior Chief Petty Officer initiated in 2015. That's pretty impressive. Uh, you're rolling right along, uh, Senior Chief Franklin. Thanks for joining us. We have an NCCM, John McFarland, in the house. We've got a Master Chief, David Mattingly. And I, these are na famous naval names in your, in your vernacular. But uh, we're really honored to have uh, such uh, senior enlisted leadership uh, uh, joining us today. And we thank you for, for being here. Um, so uh, keeping the questions uh, in the in the manpower personnel training and education domain and this is a big deal and it's a big deal to the audience um you know the uh, the navy has behaved in in uh, an incongruent manner with regard to seashore rotations i don't mean that to sound pejorative but i i just really mean it uh, you know you'll you'll hear it from the question uh and because it wasn't intended to be pejorative from the audience member who asked this but when uh, business rules for specific rates were implemented, there was a solid waterfront backbone of billets and training, uh, mobile training units. The MOTUs were rich repositories of talent to help, uh, help train uh, waterfront assets, fleet maintenance support, and other rate-centric billets. And so the idea, if you're a fire controlman, an ET, ETN, you had a 5-2 seashore rotation but today the waterfront shore duty jobs have evaporated and many sailors are relegated to recruiting or pushing boots, both tours being a minimum of three years. And it's been said that a solid performing master say fire control technician leaves their ship as a second class petty officer, serves in an out of rate assignment for three years and re returns vastly less effective than they left, but at a higher pay grade. When you add an IA, an individual augmentation assigned to the mix back in the day when we were supporting the war, in some cases, a rich resource has been out of rate for over four years. What in your mind is, are your thoughts uh, in, in alignment with this? And uh, do I have it right or does the person who asked the question have it right? And uh, are crit critical seagoing rates being diluted by a lack of relevance to their knowledge, skills, and abilities in terms of shore assignments. Uh, let's start with you, Fleet Beldo. Um, you know, I and and both of those particular um, um, do, uh, shore duties that you mentioned, of course, I'm very passionate about recruiting, and of course, recruit division commander. I, I believe that. I don't believe that they're being diluted. I believe that if you advance while you're in those shore. Um, duty billets, there is training that comes along with returning to the fleet. And I think that's what the concern is, is are we providing enough training to those individuals that were out of rate and now they're going back to the um, to their primary um, rating position? And is that knowledge while they were gone from that rate, you know, is it, is there, is there a large amount of changes that have happened while they've been out of the rate. Well, one of the things that I know that we did when I was at Recruit Training Command um, for that particular reason is to, to encourage, to encourage that they continue to stay in touch with and then provide them the time to continue to stay um, abreast of what was going on with their rating and not just forget, you know, about what they would be doing when they return to the fleet because they have to return to the fleet, right? Um, you know, in my world, I just think that if we continue to be 
our awareness and, and and make sure that we set those individuals up for success because we did ask them to do that hard job. Um, and it is our responsibility to make sure that there is a, some type of return to fleet training once they leave those jobs. And I hope that's still going on, that they can not pick up where they left off, but continue, continue the training when they get back to the fleet and still be a viable asset to their um, seagoing command. Um, Mike, help me out. Yeah, um, I'll, you know, I'm going to circle back to what uh, April's talking about, too, because I understand um, exactly where she's coming from. But let me say this. I mean, I know that our listeners out there are smart. I know that they pay attention. And so I want to have a conversation with them about this. And, and, and I hope not to sound like a politician as I'm doing it. Um, as the CEO of the Navy League of the United States, one of the strongest forcing functions that I deal with every day is this thing called our budget, right? There's what you want to do, and then there's what you can do, and budgets are real. And in the Department of the Navy, we have a budget, it, and it's rarely what we want it to be, right? Because there's a lot of factors that play into that, and our budget is complex, in the ways that we can spend money and where we can, can't can spend money. It's identified in appropriations through the NDAA process. Uh, and, and manpower is one of those pieces. And if you were to give the CNO a magic wand to wave it, he would probably always wave it so that he could have more resources available to do things for our sailors. But they have to operate within the confines of that budget. So these decisions that are made about seashore rotation are also complex. Part of it is how do we ensure that the fleet is, is manned to the best possible levels in support of strategy and O plans, et cetera, et cetera. And how can we do that within the constraint, constraints of our, of our budget? And so we have to figure out where we can reduce costs, i.e. save monies, to ensure that we have sailors available to go to sea because at the end of the day, that is the most important part of the Navy's mission is that forward presence for all the reasons that our listeners understand. And so we buy, you know, we take sailors off of shore duty. We place them in longer sea rotations and we do our best to use our amazing civilian organization to help offset some of those losses. Now, the challenge with that is a sailor goes to sea, um, comes back, doesn't have a shore duty assignment where they're able to work within their rating because it's filled by either a contractor or a civilian, you know, a GS worker in some cases. Um, and so we, those sailors go to more traditional, well, I wouldn't call them traditional, maybe they go to different shore ratings such as recruit division commander or recruiting duty, those sorts of things, because civilians and contractors cannot do those jobs, at least most of those jobs. So that shortens the short, one is it shortens and or reduces the number of shore billets available, right? In order to increase the number, you know, the, the population of sailors available to go to sea Right? But it reduces the ability to stay within your rating in some cases, uh, you know, because those shore duties aren't available, those, sh those, those shore assignments are not available. That's a reality. That isn't something the Navy would say, this is what we prefer, we want to do. This is what the Navy saying. hey, we have to do this because we need these sailors at sea. We need to reduce personnel cost. Right, which means that we can't have all these sailors going to shore duty because it's it increases your total population of sailors. And we have an end strength that we have to maintain. I think that end strength right now is somewhere around 345, 344,000 sailors on to today. And it just doesn't, the, the, the balance isn't there. You gotta have more sailors at sea than you have at shore. I and appreciate it. So that's one more part of that. So I think I'll go what April's talking about. It doesn't matter where a sailor goes. There's always opportunity to better themselves. You know, Sonny, a sailor goes to, to Great Lakes as a recruit division commander. 
I assure you when they come back, they're going to be better off for having had that experience. They're going to be, a, you know, they'll come back and in, in a couple of months or, or, or whatever the case may be, we'll get into some schools, we'll get them schooled back up and they'll be back on track with their rating. But when and when they are, they're going to be a much better sailor than when they left because the things that they will learn, the habits that they will develop, the professional decorum that they will that they will be able to absorb while they're there and bring that back to the fleet and then spread that goodness across the rest of the command. I always loved having a chief or a senior chief that came back from from RDC duty and then you put them in the division. I mean, they just brought a whole nother level of professionalism to within the division. And the same goes for instructor duty when they get instructor duty. Same thing goes for recruiting duty when they come back from recruiting duty. I mean, so yeah, they're out of their rate for a while and what they lose in their rate, they gain most of the time gain tenfold in the new thing that they're doing. Yes, right? and, then, and, and then they bring that they bring that back to the organization. So I think a lot of it is also in how we communicate it and approach it. Because sometimes we have a tendency to not look at the value of those sorts of things. We want to just talk about what we're talking about now. Oh, they're not in their rate. They're going to go do recruiting duty or they're going to go do this thing. They're not going to know how to do their job. And we just focus on that. And we don't say, yeah, but what else are they going to learn? What are they going to bring back that otherwise they would never have the opportunity to do? How do we exploit that? How do we make the best use of that? And then, oh, by the way, we'll get them up to speed. Right. I mean, that's the approach that I, I take. Well, I, I appreciate your great answers, both of you. Uh, I want to redirect back to uh, CPO 365, um, and and uh, I want to connect it to Navy history, and that's who we are, and that's what we uh, honor and revere, and we're honoring and revering 100 plus years of CPO leadership. But uh, how does the USS Constellation, uh, or excuse me, Constitution, fit in? to uh, the, the 365 and the emphasis on naval history, teaching the correct uh, singing of Anchors Away, all of the things that uh, go to the core value of a, of, of a unique attribute of a chief petty officer. Uh, and if, if we can be brief on that, because I really want to come back to some, uh, some battle stations at RTC and some questions and we're kind of running out of time. But uh, I want to redirect back to CPO 365 and any emphasis it has or is desired to have in teaching Navy history. Uh, Fleet Beldo first. All right, well, I definitely will be brief, um, but I've had the opportunity to, um, to share during that week long experience for our newest chief petty officers on two separate occasions and talk about, to your point, history and legacy and going back to the beginning and, and sharing with those newest selected chief petty officers you know, all about the history, first of all, of the um, Constitution, and then having them um, hold some of those positions, you know, on that ship and, and get it underway when we were able to get it underway and, and you know, um, make sure that they understand the importance of being a sailor during that time. Um, I think it's wonderful that we continue to do that and that we set a foundation right there for them because they do learn the basics, the basics from, you know, history. Uh, Mick Pond? Yeah, I just stepped up really quick because I wanted to show off. You know, this, was, this was a piece of the Constitution right here. Yep. This is uh, was given to me when I went up there to visit on one of the many occasions, and I, I keep it here in my office. So I, lo I love that you could smell the 245 years in this piece of wood. <laughs> Um, you know, Sonny, when your traditions are in conflict with your values, what do you change? The tradition or the value, right? And I would argue that we, ch we change the tradition. When your traditions are in keeping with your values, what do we do? We keep the tradition. And what they're doing at the Constitution is keeping with our traditions and our values in spades. And it's so important for our sailors to understand the history of our Navy, to understand the sacrifices that were made, you know, uh, those, you know, because we always talk about, you know, we have to re respect and revere those that have gone before us and made those sacrifices. And we have to remind ourselves of that every day. Make no mistake about it. 
you know, war fighting, uh, being a good sailor, you know, it, there's a lot of tangible attributes to that, but there's also emotional attributes to that as well. I mean, a sailor that's willing to go into harm's way and give their life for one of their shipmates or to take a, a risk that has to be taken that they otherwise might not want to take, sometimes you got to dig deep down in your soul and, and ask yourself why. And what we do is we reach down into our history. I mean, the history is the soul of our Navy. And so that, that constitution up there in Boston, that is a big piece of our soul, right? It's an everyday reminder of where our Navy came from. And also it's a reminder of how far our Navy's come. And so I say, keep doing it. I love that they do it. I love that the chief petty officers go up there because much like we talked about when a sailor comes back from recruit division commander duty, they have a little bit of different pep in their step. When those chiefs and those chief selectees come back from the constitution, they have a little bit different pep in their step. I mean, they, they talk about it and they talk about it for a long time. So I love it. Thank you, thank you both for the, that great answer. One of, one of the joys of being a recruit training command guest speaker is the ability to see our great recruits go through the battle station experience. One of the greatest parts of that experience are the specific examples of depth plate heroism used to train the recruits. Do either of you have specific examples of heroism at the deck plates that you witnessed or were made aware of in your tenures in the Navy? Please mention names, rates, uh, anything you can share about uh, the wonderful performance and heroic performance of our great enlisted uh, per per performance performers. Uh, Fleet Beldo. Thank you, Admiral. And I, I'll tell, uh, absolutely, I have witnessed it. I, I've had the opportunity to um, be on the aircraft carriers throughout my um, sea duty career when we were allowed to start um, um, being a part of those in 1995. But I, you know, I for one remember, um, might not have names, but I remember the rates. And, you know, what's really fascinating is being on an aircraft carrier. One of the things um, in 1995 I was on the Lincoln and we were doing an unrep. And um, once we were um, done with the unrep, we were doing the breakaway. And, you know, after you do the breakaway, everybody knows you, this is a drill, this is a drill, you know, breakaway, breakaway. And this particular um, instance, there was no, this is a drill, this is a drill. And I remember it was with the USS Sacramento with alongside of the Lincoln. And we were breaking away and um, over the 1MC, over the 1MC, um, we heard the announcement. And unfortunately, we did collide with the um, Sacramento. And these individuals from our, I was an HS6, and these young undesignated airmen were already, you know, they're always ready to go up on deck because they're waiting from the line shack, you know, from the line department, these plane captains. They took to their um, damage control stations and I was, I was in maintenance control and I was watching it on the screen, but they took to their damage control stations along with the um, ship's company, um, DC salvage, crash and salvage team. And to watch, those are young men and women, young men and women, to watch them prepare for, you know, the unknown, because we did not know what the damage was at that point. We were just making sure that everybody was where they needed to be. But I, as a young AZC at the time, first deployment, first um, opportunity, you know, to be at sea and to watch them choreograph, because that's what I'll say it was, but everybody was where they needed to be. And again, I just mentioned the line check that I was a part of because those young undesignated airmen, undesignated airmen, um, been in the Navy probably less than a year, were on station, manning hoses, and were prepared to do whatever they were called to do based on um, Skipper's instructions. So um, that's what I remember. And that was young in my career with a chief, you know, but not even have to say anything. They just all did what they were supposed to do. Brings oh, water to your eyes today. <laughs> uh, Mick Pond, uh, what, uh, what are your uh, remembrances? 
Sure, I'm going to tie this all together because it's going to include recruit training command, fleet beldo, and an actual experience that occurred. So, uh, in uh, eight, on 18 February of 1991 at 4:36 in the morning, I remember it to the minute because uh, I was a helicopter crew chief flying airborne mine countermeasures off the coast of Kuwait during Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We were fly flying missions in live minefields. Uh, these, were, these were combat missions. We were on the USS Tripoli. Uh, we were in a, in a box following a Q route. We were in a box surrounded by minefields sweeping these mines and at 4 36 in the morning the captain had to make a decision to exit out of that box because we had a missile site that was uh, painting us with active radar i was just getting up from my rack at the time getting ready for a flight brief no sooner did i have one leg out of the rack and we struck a moored mine on our starboard side and we blew a 16 by 20 foot hole in the side of our ship and to talk about the chaos that ensued uh, would take the rest of this program. But, you know, the, the explosion knocked our boilers out. It was dark outside, dark inside. There was flooding that was happening in compartments. And, you know, the, the crew responded, you know, once the, you know, when I say the dust settles, I mean that both literally and figuratively, because now I learned why we do field days because when a mine hits the side of your ship, every bit of dust in the overhead came down and literally blacked out our compartment. Um, so you know, we, got out, we got out of our compartment and got to our battle stations. But I remember as an Airedale, I'm going up to my battle station, which was on the flight deck because uh, I was a crew chief. I had to help man a helicopter. As I was going up, the ship's company was going down. And they were going down into the thick of it where they didn't even know what they were going into because it was smoke and fumes and paint because it hit a paint locker coming out of these these hatches like it was being sprayed out of an aerosol can but these sailors went down in there without hesitation led by some great chiefs and warrant officers that went down in there with them and three of those sailors received silver stars and another three of them received bronze stars for their heroic actions because that ship, we were at abandoned ship stations. That's how bad it was. And that crew, that, that damage control team, they saved that ship. Um, they went down and they saved that ship and we stayed out there for another 10 days pumping water and fuel and trying to save that ship and and we continued to fly combat missions after that had occurred for those 10 days before we went to Jabal Ali to start our repair and cross over to the, to the New Orleans. So I was a second class petty officer at the time. I think I was 26 years old. You know, it was quite an experience, right? Going out there and flying these missions, then being on that ship when we hit that, that, that mine. Uh, fast forward the tape, it's 2006, I'm going through the Senior Enlisted Academy. I've been a Master Chief at the time for about four years. Um, one of the things you get to do is go to RTC. And when I was at the Academy, and so we get on a plane, we fly out to you know, Chicago, we go up to North Chicago to recruit training command, and guess who's the CMC? I'd never met her before, but the Command Master Chief was Fleet Master Chief, now April Beldo. And her and Captain Annie Andrews were there together, and they made a dynamic duo for sure. And I didn't know this, but I went inside the battle stations because that's one of the things we got to do is witness battle stations. And guess what one of the battle stations were? It was the USS Tripoli. It was the experience of the Tripoli. I was just, and, and a good friend of mine that was there with me, his name was Senior Chief John Henderson, and John Henderson was a member of the USS Cole when they when they got hit in uh, 2000, I believe it was 2000. And so he and I are there, and the Cole and the Tripoli are the two battle stations events that are happening. And Captain Andrews, I don't know how she knew this, but Captain Andrews knew that John and I were veterans of those two events and called us both out and said to the recruits, Essentially, I want to know you want you to know why you're doing this because this is real because what you're doing here This this senior chief, or I'm sorry. He was a master chief this master chief and this master chief 
were actually on those ships when those things took place. So you talk about bringing it all together. Now I'll say, I did nothing heroic. You know, I did my job and survived. The people that did the heroic things were those three silver star and three bronze stars. And those, those men that went down into that hole of the unknown to save that ship. I, I, I think about that often. I'm like, who does that? Who goes into an environment like that? You know who does that? The United States sailor, that's who does that. They sure do, they sure do. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing those stories. And of course, uh, Captain Paul Wren, commanding officer then of the Sammy B. Roberts, you know, he's got a lot of uh, great stories regarding his crew uh, and so many, so many stories. Um, what, what are your thoughts, uh, and this comes from about six uh, people in the audience, on advanced education for uh, chief petty officers. And I, and I would say in Millington, we had 400 plus uh, chief petty officers, E7s through E9. And, uh, and most of the students in our advanced education courses came from that population. And every quarter, it seemed like we were honoring, you know, 10 to 20, uh, you know, graduates with bachelor's and even master's degrees. Uh, but what are your thoughts about uh, uh, a chief petty officer making the time for secondary education of Fleet Beldo? Uh, I, I think it's important. I, I think it's very important. I believe that we need to balance that to make sure that it does not, you know, um, take the place of their primary responsibility. But what I will share is we are not always going to be in the Navy. And, and, and we're going to retire. And when we transition to our um, to corporate America, if that's what we're going to do, um, that goes a long way. That is what they're looking for. That's how we continue our um, our purpose, you know, in, in in the the country. You know, so for somebody to say I don't need to be educated, I I think that's a a misquote. But there's a balance there. But it is very important, and we need to continue to do whatever we can do as an organization to promote that because they will not always be in the military. Yeah, let me let me jump on that before we get to Mick Pond's answer. Uh, in Millington, we had a lot of individuals say they retired, they were at 32, they needed to go, it was time to retire. And they went right into uh, secondary education teaching jobs. And of course, in Arkansas, for example, there, there was a, they could immediately go other than having in, in Tennessee, you have to take extra courses and all this kind of thing. But Arkansas was, uh, very, they loved uh, having a former chief petty officer, retired chief petty officer, because control of the classroom is not even up, open for discussion. A uh, seasoned veteran chief petty officer knows how to handle a class. And they love, I mean, it's beloved. It's not a heavy handed, you would think it's a heavy, it's not heavy handed at all. It's just these people bring this experience in these classrooms and they, they explode in knowledge and connectivity to the students. And so uh, that, that was a real second, nice second order effect for those retiring directly in Arkansas, public education said, hey, we'll hire as many as, as we'll, you know, we'll come, up, come aboard, which was kind of neat. And of course, some of those, if you know the neighborhood of Toka and you know, Mumford and all these places, it was a little bit of a haul driving wise crossing the Mississippi River Bridge, but uh, but uh, there were there were great jobs available. Mick Pond, your thoughts on secondary education? Sure. I can't remember the exact year, but I th so this will also uh, speak to you, you when you asked the question earlier in the program about um, you know working with senior flag officers. So it was either 2013 or 14. I, I can't remember late 13 or early 14, but the fleet would probably remember better than me when um, there was this big push to um, remove tuition assistance and put it into the operating account. It was a DOD decision. So this, uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense, and I, and I don't wanna get this wrong because I wasn't in that room at that time, but my understanding was that the SecDef or someone in OSD had strongly recommended to the service chiefs because we were in sequestration and the budget was super tight that we suspend tuition assistance and move those monies into the operating account uh, to ensure that war fighting readiness didn't suffer as a, as you know to the best degree possible. Uh, so 
Admiral Greener um, had his team give me a call and said, hey, have Mick Pond come and see me. And so I went to his office and we sat down and he said, hey, you know, this is what's being asked of us. I'm pretty sure the other service chiefs are going to do it. I didn't want to say yes until we had a conversation about it first because I need to I want to hear your thoughts on it. And he also knew that if he said he didn't want to do it because he wasn't being directed to do it, that he could find himself on the outside looking in. And he said, what are your thoughts on, to, on, on secondary education, tuition assistance with our sailors is, and the impact it would have versus taking that money and moving it into our operating account for war fighting? I said, so that's, the, that's their argument? CNO? And he said, that, yeah, that's their argument. And I said, well, it doesn't make sense to me because a more educated sailor, a sailor that has increased critical thinking skills, a smarter sailor is a better warfighter. I said, you go on board a destroyer and you have a bunch of sailors that have secondary education. Some of those may even have master's degrees. They have enhanced critical thinking skills they're sharper intellectually. I said, that is a better warfighter. Not to take away from anybody who hasn't done that, but that's just the fact. They're better, they can, they, they can be better warfighters. And so when we remove tuition assistance and we take away from the secondary education aspect of the Navy, I said, I think we're not, you know, moving that money into a different account does not make us a better and more effective fighting force. It makes us a more challenged fighting force because a smarter sailor is a better war fighter. And he goes, thank you for that, right? So he went back and he talked to OSD and he said, look, our, our force is a technical force. Regardless of what you're doing in the Navy, it, it requires a sailor that's a critical thinker, has intellectual capability and capacity and when we start removing these education opportunities from them, we degrade our war fighting capabilities. So we're going to keep tuition assistance in place. And guess what? We did. We kept it in place and all the other services took it, took it out during that period of time. We also knew that when you take away something like that, good luck trying to get it back. <laughs> right. And so they fought for years. The other services fought for years to bring their tuition systems back into the program because those monies have been divested. And we're, and we're funding other things. But I tell you, to this day, I remember that like yesterday because I was so proud to be the Master Chief of the Navy and working for Admiral Greenard at that time where he took a stand different than everybody else. And he did that because he believed it was in the best interest of our sailors and our Navy, even though it probably wasn't a popular decision at OSD at the time because they just wanted them, that money back in the operating accounts. So my, my, my feeling is it's not just good for the chief petty officer, but an educated force is a better force and it's good for every sailor in the Navy. And I'm, I'm excited that our sailors have the opportunity to get those educations and April and I are both benefactors of tuition assistance and, and, and secondary education. And that's opened up new windows for us, you know, since we've gotten out of the, out of the service and it probably made us better than we would have been while we were in uniform. Yeah, my, my force master chief, Daryl Charles, uh, got both a bachelor's and a master's, and I never even knew he was in school because he wanted to keep it under the radar, and it never interfered with his duties. He was everywhere. He was like Superman. If something was going on in housing, he knew about it. And Jim Monroe, Force Monroe at uh, Surfland was another one just like that who took, you know, great, got great benefit. And, uh, and you would read, hear something on the news and, you know, you'd have to deal with it in the morning and force had already been, you know, on the ship, had all the, you know, I, I talked to the uh, chief's mess. I know the ground truth, uh, but, but never his education was always an adjunct and, uh, and uh, it never interfered. So uh, a couple, uh, we, we, regrettably, this rich discussion has got to come to an end. But I, but I want to uh, briefly, who's the most influential persons in your career at any pay grade? And then, um, and then I want to uh, have, it, have it wrapped up by your final comments. Uh, Fleet Beldo, who was the most influential person at any pay grade? 
That is a trick question. And that's a very hard, you know, question because I think everywhere you go, you meet somebody who basically re-energizes you. Um, but I will share with you, um, I was on the, just checking into the USS Carl Vinson in 2010 and CMC there, you know, figuring out where everybody was. We were in the middle of RCOH and um, one young um, chief came to me and he said, CMC, we need to go to the VA hospital in Richmond, Virginia. And so I said, we do. And he told me the story about a young, um, she was an LS3 and she had gotten into a really bad car accident. And of course she was um, in there for like six or nine months by the time I got there, she was learning how to walk again, um, still had some inju injuries that she had to overcome. But bottom line was we need to go there CMC because prior to her car accident, she had just completed her ESWS qualifications. And the only thing that she could keep on talking about when he went to go visit her was the fact that, when am I gonna get pinned? When am I gonna get pinned? And I thought, wow. So I said, absolutely, absolutely. So duty driver, myself and her chief, we drove up to the VA hospital, but that set the tone for me as a command master chief on board the USS Carl Vincent. And, you know, it just, I, I remember it now, it, you know, I get all, you know, soft about it when I talk about it, but wow, these are the sailors that I am serving on board this carrier. And um, it was gonna be a long journey over the next two and a half years coming out of RCOH, changing our um, port from Virginia to San Diego, but that's what set the tone. And I think about that young sailor often when I was feeling some kind of way um, during the next couple of years, you know, in the positions that I had to think young E4, all I want to do is just get it, get pinned. So she was definitely in, influential as I took up aboard the, uh, as I took command of C, um, CMC at Carl Vinson. Get all tongue tied now just thinking about it. But, and there are many more, but that's the one that sticks in. When, when you think about being a senior sailor and there's junior sailors that all they want to do is just make a difference and, and be a part of something bigger than themselves. How dare we as leaders, you know, get overwhelmed with, you know, what's going on in our world. So that's who kept me going after that um, incident. Thank you so much, uh, Mick Pond. So I think I have, uh, I wrote a list down. I have, there's 17 sailors that have had a uh, positive influence on me personally and professionally in, in different ways. And it's and so 17 together that help in some way shape you to become the person that you are today. And I, and I look at, uh, you know, I look at it like I look at leadership. So what's a good mentor? A mentor is somebody who influences you, right? In, 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 in a positive way. So I'm gonna go down the list and I'm gonna tell you who the person who personally for me, and it happened later in my career, just made me take a different look at things and help me to, if, how do I elevate, you know? And I would submit to you that I probably wouldn't be here today as the CEO of the Navy League um, or had the opportunity to be the CEO of this company that I ran in Pittsburgh, had I not met this person that really helped me understand what it meant to be, you know, a person of greater influence and to, and to step up my life to the next level. So anyways, first person is, is uh, SM2 Case, who was my company commander at Recruit Training Command in 1983, June of 1983 is when I met this person. Vietnam veteran, you know, uh, just uh, wise beyond his years and his rating or his rank, I should say, not rating his rank. Uh, so SM2 case, Petty Officer, First Class, AMS1, Joe Knight, AMH1, Neil Rigney, AMC, Chief Petty Officer, Bill Krieg, Master Chief Tom Smith, Master Chief Ken Mackey, Master Chief Jackie DeRosa, Master Chief Bill White, Mick Pond, Rick West, Fleet Master Chief April Beldo, Fleet Master Chief Mike McCaleb. And then I'll move into the officer was my XO at VCA, John Fastashi, my, my CO at 14, HM14, Mark Joint, my deputy commander at the wing, Mike, Captain Mike Cashman, then Vice Admiral Mel Williams, Admiral John Harvey, Admiral Greenard, Admiral Richardson. 
you can't work for those people and not be a better person for having had that experience. But of all those people, the, per the person that really, because of how he lives his life, both personally and professionally, the way he is behind open and closed doors, and, I, and you get to know these people in every respect. You spend time traveling around the world with them and you get to see who they are at their core. The person who helped me get to the next level was Admiral John Richardson, CNO Richardson. And I'm so proud to say that we still interact today. He's an executive vice president on our board here at the Navy League. Uh, he has an office in our building. And so I get to see him once every couple of weeks and have a conversation but he's such a good and decent person and, and in and out, um, recognizes who he is as a person for, and, and is willing to sit down and have this, just whatever kinds of conversations or interactions that are necessary to help you get to the, you know, the places that you want to go. And so I just hold him in reverence and high regard. But every one of those people have had significant influence on me personally I know April doesn't know that because I've never told her that, but uh, I, I watched her from the time she was a recruit training command till her carrier tour and till her time as a force and a fleet. And I love the way she interacted with sailors and her passion and enthusiasm. And then I've just watched her in her private, you know, her, her civilian career as she's moved up and along and continues to interact with the Navy and be involved in ways that are meaningful. And, uh, you know, she's a role model. And, you know, I say that because she's here, but I could have that conversation with, you know, the people that I mentioned on there. So thank you for the opportunity because nobody gets where they're at by themselves. Well, thank you for, uh, for sharing that. And of course, I want to bring uh, two points out. Uh, uh, Fleet Beldo is wearing a, uh, a Master Chief Petty Officer uh, collar device around her neck. And, uh, but where you really wear it is in your soul and in your demeanor and we just as the Constitution is the soul of the Navy, you know, you are a real beacon in the soul of, of, of all CPOs uh, who, who will be promoted and who are promoted now. And your service was uh, amazing, stellar. Um, I, I don't have enough adjectives to, uh, to, to commend you. And uh, as for you, um, you know, there's a, the, the old saying from uh, John F. Kennedy, ask not, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I think just an, as an important uh, uh, statement is one you made today, when, when uh, values and traditions conflict, you know, what, what should you choose? And I think that's uh, something that we should all be mindful of as citizens, people, uh, and, and to create the best Navy we can. And it's, it's that ethos that, uh, that really rode herd over your leadership as our 13th MCPON. And uh, I'm proud to be very close to about six six of the McPons, uh, uh, and and I and I'm so proud of, of working with them, uh, and and you all are so unique and, and and magnanimous to your to your service over selfless service over self, but uh, thank you for that. And I'm going to actually do a short video on on your explanation of that and put it out here real soon uh, in the next few weeks. Um, the, the last, uh, I'm going to let you guys uh, have final comments and thoughts, but uh, you brought great honor to our foundation's program today, and, um, and Chief Petty Officer is a holy rank, uh, E7, 8, and 9. Uh, I, I, was, I presided over promotions in Iran, uh, or excuse me, in, in Iraq back in, um, in, the, in about 2007, and General Petraeus uh, called me in and said, what, what, "So what's you know what is this thing you y'all are doing?" Uh, he doesn't speak like that, but <laughs> he wanted to know you know what's what's going on you know. And and when I explained it to him, he asked if he could attend. And he actually spoke and he brought his command sergeant major and and he kind of turned to him and said, "Why don't we do this?" You know, kind of from the army side. But uh, but anyway. Over to you, uh, Fleet Beldo, for a, for a final comments, and then I'll wrap the whole thing up after uh, Nick Pond's final comments. Thank you, Admiral Masso. And, and to you and to Mick Pond, Mike Stevens, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here and to participate in the panel this Saturday. Um, you could have chose anyone. You could have chose anyone. No, and I chose you. <laughs> I, I'm humbled and, and honored that you did. Um, 
Mike Stevens always says you're only as good as the um, individuals that you're surrounded with. And, and, and I believe that I was only able to do the things. I remember the day that I was contemplating probably exiting the Navy because there was no other position for me to go to when I was the Command Master Chief on the Carl Vinson. It was 2012 and the second fleet fleet master chief came on board the ship and had a conversation with me. Well, first of all, I got the call on the brick. There's somebody down here that wants to come and talk to you. And, and always when I got that call, I was always busy doing something and I sort of got a little irritated. I was like, who came unannounced? I'm busy. And then they said, oh, they said fleet master. I said, oh, okay, I'm coming down to the quarterback right now. But we had a conversation that day a uh, mic on the ship and, and there were some things coming up on the pike and you said, what are you gonna do next? And I didn't think there was anything next for me to do based on where we were with regards to force fleet positions were already um, filled. But ironically, one came open and you were there to make sure that I knew it was open and that you had the trust and the confidence that I would be able to do that position if I was interested in um, I'm applying for it. So, so thank you so much for your mentorship and your friendship and you allowing me to um, just, like I said, be my authentic self and listen. We didn't always get along. People don't know that. And we had those, you call me up there when I was at N1 and I'd be like, mm, again, again, here you are. But um, it, it was definitely a pleasure and I'm glad that we can continue um, sitting together and having these type of conversations. So. Thank you again, um, Admiral Masso, um, Mike, Mick Pond Stevens. If it wasn't for individuals like you, and I mean that with all my heart, I would not be getting the accolades that you're giving me, Admiral Masso and Mick Pond Stevens. So thank you. And, and to the audience, thank you very much for listening to us. I, I, you know, I don't always get it right, but it's not because I'm not trying. Thank you, uh, Mick Pond. Yeah, I just echo everything uh, April just said. Thank you, Sonny, for the opportunity. Um, it, you should, you know, it's e it's easy to lose sight of it sometimes, but we should never take moments like this for granted because how many people get an opportunity to sit down with the CEO of or the of the you know the the foundation that you're leading there at the at the history. Uh, at the History and Heritage Foundation there in uh, at the Washington Naval Yard um, and have a conversation like this. You know, look, there's no sailor out there that need that needed more help than me. And the fact that all the sailors that I, I read off earlier and then the tens of thousands that I knew and didn't know that had me, you know, that took care of me directly or indirectly um, provided me with every opportunity that the Navy put in front of me. Uh, I could only hope that in some small way that I was able to live up to their expectations and provide them with the leadership that they deserve and frankly should, you know, expect of us, demand of us. Um, and so I just wanted to close by saying thank you. Thank you to the sailors that served before our time for those that are that served with us and that serve today because i know this without without our navy the world is a, a totally different place and 71 percent i believe 71 percent of this planet is covered in water and the united states navy is somewhere really the united states navy is everywhere all the time ensuring that to the best degree possible, our, our world, our nation is our nation is secure. Our world is secure. That commerce flows freely. That we keep the bad guys in check. You know, everybody knows we got those SSBNs sitting out there somewhere as a deterrent. We have those aircraft carriers that are able to launch a strike at a moment's notice when the president says, "Where's my carriers?" We have all those combatant ships out there providing missile, ballistic missile defense and, and other operational requirements. And then all those ships that are out there providing the, su the support that's necessary to keep the tip of the spear going. Right? Without our Navy, this world is not the world that we know today. 
we think it's we think that the world is a little bit chaotic sometimes you don't want to know the world without the united states navy and so to have served in it and continue to be a part of it in some way is an honor beyond pale and i'm just grateful to have been a part of it and continue to interact in some way and i thank those sailors that are out there doing the heavy lifting and their families out there doing the heavy lifting so thank you very much for this opportunity, Sonny. Today's second Saturday show has been remarkable, especially given the stellar careers of our panelists and their honest and forthright answers to some tough questions. One thing is for sure, underscored by, by Mick Pond just, just a second ago, our sailors will always exceed what we ask of them because of great leaders like you've seen today. Mick Pond Stevens, Fleet Beldo, thank you. If you liked our content today, please hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell. It helps our foundation immensely. Please consider joining our foundation by just checking in at www.navyhistory.org. Happy Saturday. Enjoy the rest of your day out here. <laughs>